Rusty preached um, a message called Connected. And um, if you want to say this could be Connected Part 2, but I do have a title that I'm going to give you, um, and I'll give that to you in a little while. But just to kind of recap and summarize, if you weren't here last week, and to refresh your memories for those of you that were, um, he talked out of John 15 and abiding in the vine, living a life out of love himself, of course, which is Jesus. And in that life, Jesus said, I would that you would bear much fruit. John 15, 4, uh, Jesus said, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And he left us with three points uh, at the end of that message, and they were this, stay connected, understand love, and live a life out of love. So if staying connected to the vine is vital to our life in Christ, then you can be sure that the devil's number one place, target, and place of attack will be that very place of connection. If he can disconnect you, or let me say this, if he can get you to disconnect from that place, because how many of you know the devil can't make you do anything? Maybe someone doesn't realize that. All he can get you to do is partner with him and move that direction. So if he can get you to partner with him and disconnect, he can steal your life, he can steal your joy, he can steal your peace, because Jesus said you will have this life in the vine. You are the branches. He said, I am the vine. So I must choose to stay in the fight to stay connected. How many of you have found that sometimes that is a bit of a fight? So what does abiding in Jesus really look like? What is this place of connection? So our text today is going to be two places in the psalm, Psalms 23. So if you have your Bibles, which I pray you do, how many of you know students come to school with their books? And the greatest, word, the greatest book you'll ever read and study is this word because this is the life of God right here. This is his love letter to you. So if you have your Bibles, open up. If you're on your phones, wherever your Bible is at, Psalms 23. And we're also going to be looking in Psalms 78, verses 18 through 22. And I'll, I'll give those to you again before we get there. But both of these passages in Scripture mention the place, mention where this battle takes place, the battle to abide, and staying connected to love himself, where this battle is won or lost. So the message title today, the title of this, if you're taking notes, is Table 23, Party of Two. Table 23, Party of Two. How, say with this with me, there is a table, and I have a place there. Say it again, there is a table. And I have a place there. We're going to read together. If you, it's going to be on the, the, the slides overhead, or you can read it out of your Bible. I'm in the New King James Version. But will you read with me Psalms 23? I know it's a very familiar passage to most people, but it's not just a passage for funerals. This is a passage that speaks of life. And we're going to read it together today. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There is a table, as you just got done saying, and there is a place for each one of us there. My question to you today, the thing that I want to stir within your heart to come to the place in your own life is will you take your seat 
at the table. So let me just pray. Father, I thank you today. I ask you, God, to give us eyes that see and ears that hear. Apart from you, Holy Spirit, we don't see and we don't hear. We are dull and we are blind. But I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you live within me to reveal the word of God, the word of truth, inside of our hearts and our lives. So I thank you today for fresh manna, fresh bread. I thank you for fresh oil, Lord God, that you're going to anoint our heads with today. I thank you, Father God, that healing is going to happen, Lord, as the word is preached, because the Bible is the only book we can read or talk about that brings healing as we read it. And so, Father, we receive today from the table of the Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So this message today is going to be in three parts. We're going to talk about, first, the problem, the question, and then the answer. Easy enough. The problem, the question, and the answer. And we're going to start with the problem. The problem is this. Help! I'm in the wilderness. Anybody might be there right now. You might be in a place of the wilderness. But how many of you know, I just believe if you're doing great in one area of your life, usually you're in a wilderness in another area of your life. So all of us have come in today in this place. And Psalm 78 speaks of Israel's wilderness season. And we're going to get to that scripture in just a little while. It talks about the desert wanderings when they were set free from Egypt and they walked across the Sinai Desert on their way to the Promised Land. Wilderness seasons are often a great time of shift, change, and uncertainty in our lives. In these seasons, the devil loves to hang in the shadows and bring doubt, confusion, and disappointment. It's the season where everything you thought it was supposed to look like comes crashing down. And your cry is this. It's not supposed to be this way. It's not supposed to be this way. Anybody there right now? It's not supposed to be this way. Ever been there? I think yes. It's the place where you feel like you're between trapezes, where you leave the familiar for the unfamiliar. Sometimes we call it a desert season, a frightening place where you have to let go of the past, but the future has not yet arrived. You let go because you have to, but then you wait, hanging in space, hoping and praying the tra- that the other trapeze arrives in time. It's in this place that it's easy to begin to doubt God, yourself, and become disconnected. But it's in this place, this place, that we have to fight to stay connected. And it was in this place in my own life, in a season in my own life, that felt like, How many of you ever just prayed and prayed and prayed about something and years have gone by and you're finding yourself still praying? Am I the only one in the house? And I was in here in this sanctuary right here, what we call the living room, and I love to pray. On on Tuesdays, I'll come in and I'll pray, and I love just to walk the place. And for some reason, I always gravitate over here to this wall. (laughs) And I was praying, and I was up against that wall, and I was reading the scripture that was on the board, uh, on the wall over here. How many, you can turn over here, it's to my right, to your left, and it says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, out of Jeremiah 29, 11. That scripture goes on to say there are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. And when I was up against the wall, the Lord, I've read that many times, but I I was just sitting there and all of a sudden those words on that wall came off the wall to me and they came off like this. And this is what God said to me. It was almost like he had his hand against my chest. I was up against the wall and then the Lord said, For I know the plans I have for you. The I know and I have jumped off the page to me in a way that I had never seen before. And when he said that to me, he said this, And my will, my way. And I knew in that moment, that he was bringing deep instruction, deep correction to my life. 
Because when God speaks, the reality of his words become life to you. And it was in that moment he said, not my, and I'm speaking as God, not my will your way, and not your will my way, but my will my way. Say that with me. My will my way. And that would be God speaking there. In that moment, the Lord showed me what the problem really was. I'll never forget it. And all of a sudden, I realized how badly I wanted my will my way. Just like this guy right here. You know what it felt like? Um, it felt like dad strength. You know when you were a kid and you're wrestling with your dad, you know, and he's just taking all the hits and he's toying with you, and then boom, he just takes you down? Jesus setting me straight that day. That, that felt a lot like that. Okay, okay, I know, I know. Hindsight is twenty twenty, but at that time and at that moment, I, I, I just couldn't figure out what he was talking about, you know? I mean, why did he have to suffer? Why did he have to die? No, 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 not, not on my watch. This wasn't going to happen. No, sir. It just wasn't like he was, he was thinking straight, you know? I kept thinking maybe he's dehydrated. Maybe he's hungry. The man never got enough to eat, if you ask me. So I take him aside, and I start get laying into him. And before I could even get very far, he stops me, he looks me in the eyes, because he has those eyes. And you know what he said to me? Get behind me, Satan. Dad's strength. Those words, those eyes, that moment floored me. He floored me. <sighs> but I mean, seriously, get behind me, Satan. All right, I admit I have some flaws, you know, but Satan, I mean, that stung a bit, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I just didn't get it. I just didn't see the whole picture, which won't be the last time that'll happen, mind you. <laughs> you see, I, I wanted him to use that, that dad strength on the world, you know? I mean, <sighs> my desires, my plans. And your boy, Peter's plans, they don't always work out so good, i.e. ear slicing, etc. But he knew, he knew all along, <laughs> he would give us just enough rope for allow us to figure things out for ourselves. And then he just, he had that dad strength, you know? He pulls back in. Right at that moment, we needed saving from ourselves. That was his plan all along, saving us from ourselves. Saving me from myself. Father, it is saving me from myself. That he has saved me but he continues to save me from myself. And that's where I want this word to land today. It's an us word, but more than that, it's a you word. Will you go with me to that place where this word just goes to your heart? This isn't to think in a group, because the title of this message is Table 23, Party of Two. Jesus and you. It was in that moment, that dad's strength, I love that description, that that's what I felt up against that wall. That when he said, and I know the plans I have. In that moment, letting go of what I thought it should look like, how I thought it should happen, what I wanted it to do, how hard I had worked to, to make sure that it all turns out right. 
that I let go of that and say, Father, not my will. I want your will. How many of you know that's exactly what Jesus did in the garden? He didn't say it was a sin to have a will and a plan. The Bible says many are the plans in the minds of a man, but it's God that will direct his steps. But if you want the plan that God has for you, if you want to partner in the life that he created for you to live and the person he made you to be and to walk into the discovery of that, we have to let go of what we thought it should look like so that it can become and that we can partner with him in what he's created for us. His hand held me and his love spoke truth to my heart. The struggle of my own independence was staring me in the face. And the only prayer that I can pray in that place is, Father, I want your will, your way. Just like Peter, God bent me in my brokenness and delivered me and continues to deliver me from myself toward greater love and affection in him. He will use what feels like the most barren desert season to teach us the wonder of his love. Nothing is stronger than his love. And if the wilderness is the path to discover it, then here we go. One thing that I have learned is that God serves high spiritual protein food in the wilderness. There are things that you need for your life that you will only find with him in the wilderness. All you have to do is ask Jesus. Let's try John the Baptist, the Apostle Paul, who all were led by the Lord out into the wilderness and two-thirds of our New Testament, written by the Apostle Paul, was the discovery of what he found in the wilderness with the Lord. There are no shortcuts through the desert, guys. It is a necessary path for every believer's life. Is it painful? Yes. But so is every process of growth and development. Have you found that to be true even in the natural and where the enemy comes is in that pain to disconnect you from the very source of abiding in the life that God has given you. To not only make it through the wilderness, but to come out on the other side ready to fight the giants and take the land that God has given you. It's in this season that we're most tempted to quit, turn back, isolate, and disconnect. But just like Israel during the Exodus, who came to God with the question that most of us have also asked. And this brings me to the second part of this message, which is the question. The question is, can God provide a table in the wilderness? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's the right answer. But it was a question that Israel asked. It is a question that we ask. But I want you to see and know the context of which Israel asked that question. Most of you are probably familiar with the Exodus story. If you're not, come to my life class on Sunday mornings. It's the most amazing study as we're in the book of Exodus. And we get to learn of this nation called Israel as they are being delivered out of Egyptian bondage. 430 years in slavery. And God sends a deliverer named Moses to deliver them out. To take them to the promised land. To take them to a land at that time that was called Canaan. To the promised land. But there was a huge, if you look at it on the map, it's the whole desert in between. The Sinai Peninsula. They had to wander through, and how many people know how long they stayed in that desert before they crossed in? Forty years. So Psalm 78 is a whole review, but the, the, and I encourage you to read the whole of Psalm 78 later on, but it contrasts God's goodness, God's kindness, God's love, God's faithfulness to a rebellious complaining, wicked, unthankful people. That's all that Psalm 78 talks about, and I encourage you in that. It's a psalm of warning. The writer of the Psalm 78 um, talks about, uh, warns of the things that the Jews who left Egypt did to provoke God. And yes, in Psalm 78, you're going to see God gets mad. But it also reveals God's incredible mercy and kindness to a people that were totally unfaithful and unthankful. 
Israel watched God do more miracles in this 40-year period. Let's just look at, just for a second, the deliverance out of Egypt alone. There were 10 different plagues that affected and impacted and ended up killing many of the Egyptian people, all the firstborn sons of every Egyptian dead at the end of this 10 plagues as Pharaoh would not let the people of Israel go. Had a chance at every opportunity, let my people go. He said, okay, I'll let them go. No, I'm not. And God would send another plague. But did you know that the Jews were preserved? They lived in the very same country but yet God's hand protected them. God's hand shielded them. They come out by a deliverer. God sends a man, a Jew named Moses, who'd been raised up in Pharaoh's household for 40 years. Moses had the best uh, schooling, university training, the best military training, ends up Knowing he's the deliverer for this people, it's too much to go into to describe all of Moses' incredible story. He spends 40 years out on the backside of the desert himself. Again, the desert season is required. And he comes back to save the people. And he brings them out and they come to the Red Sea. The Jews, this nation of people, saw more signs and wonders physically on planet Earth than any other generation of people has ever seen. As they stand at the Red Sea and they watch the Red Sea part, literally the scripture says that, they, <clears throat> that the Red Sea was held back like walls. And I love in the Psalms, and Isaiah it also says that the people crossed over the sea, the bottom of the sea, like it was a road. Two million people crossed over while God held the walls of water back. And then when they turned around to look, the, wall, the Egyptian army, which was the greatest military force and might on the earth at that time, comes chasing after them, and the walls of water come crashing down, and their enemy is destroyed in the sea. What a day of rejoicing as they rejoice and they watch. How many of you know it's an awesome thing to see your enemy swallowed up? Three days later, they're traveling through the wilderness, and they're getting thirsty, and they begin to, how many of you know being thirsty is a real thing? But instead of going back and praising God with their mouths and saying, Father, we thank you. Look what you did for us back there. They begin to gripe complain, forget what God has done to deliver. And oh, God is so faithful. God does miracle after miracle. He gives them water out of a rock. The Bible says it wasn't just a trickle of water. It says it literally was a river. How many of you know it probably takes a river to quench the thirst of two million people out in the middle of the desert? God was a cloud by day, sent a cloud, his glory cloud, that literally covered them by day. How many of you know that was a good, good sunscreen for him? Yeah. To shield them from the elements of the heat, but also to be the presence upon them and to be the GPS that they needed to know where to go. He was a fire by night, it says, to warm them and to protect them and also to give them light. The Bible says that their shoes didn't even wear out. How many of you realize we got little kids going with us on this journey? What do little kids do? They grow up. You know that well, right? And the shoes, did they didn't have a shoe store to go to. They didn't have places to make new clothes. The Bible says their clothes didn't wear out. Miracle after miracle. Their real need for food, hunger, what does God do? He says, I'll send you manna. The Bible literally says that the grain, I love the Passion Translation, it says the grain of heaven came out of the sky for them. And every morning they would go out and they would pick it up and they would, it was the bread that they would eat and they would make it into all kinds of things. Literally, the Bible says it was, they ate the food of angels. But then they began to grumble and complain because that bread wasn't enough and they wanted meat. They wanted more. And when they got tired of the bread, they asked God for meat, and the Bible says that God rained meat on them like dust. But verse 18 says this, they tested God in their hearts by asking for the food of their fancy. The Passion Translation says they tested God just to get what they wanted. They still wanted their will their way. How many of you know just because you got saved and delivered 
And, and that is awesome. And the cross delivered you from your bondage in Egypt. There is a journey of discipleship that we're walking on. How many of you found some ugly stuff inside yourself? How many of you found that in the midst of it, because I'm reading this, you know, and when I'm going over this in the Exodus, I find myself just getting like really mad at the Jews. I find myself wanting to wrap my arm around Moses and go, thank you. <laughs> and then the Lord with that God strength puts his hand on me and says, <clears throat> excuse me, honey, you're, you're, you're the same way. <laughs> oh, you're right, Lord. Like just yesterday, just this morning, when in the middle of what I'm going through is more real than the who you goodness of who you really are. And so I hang my head and I, I don't praise and I find griping words coming out of my mouth. Oh yeah, I'm a bit like them, aren't I? An attitude of entitlement common to all of us revealed itself in a split second from these former slaves as they kind of sat at the table and this is how ugly it looks. Is that all you got, God? Is that all you got? The food of our fancy. Verses 20 through 22, the people go on and say this. This is the people speaking. Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they did not believe in God and did not trust his salvation. I want to read, this is not in my notes, but I want to read this real quickly out of Psalm 78 in the Passion Translation, verse 38 through 42 says this, but amazingly, God, so full of compassion, still forgave them. He covered over their sins with his love, refusing to destroy them all. Over and over, he held back his anger, restraining wrath to show them mercy. He knew that they were made from mere dust, fra frail, fragile, and short-lived, here today and gone tomorrow. How many times they rebelled in their desert days, how they grieved him with their grumblings, Again and again, they limited God, prevented him from blessing him, from blessing them. Continually, they turned back from him and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They forgot his great love, how he took them by the hand. And with redemption's kiss, he delivered them from their enemies. Is it possible that God is working miracles in our midst and we totally miss seeing the table of his provision right in front of us? Did you hear what I just read, that their faithlessness and their lack of thankfulness did, that they didn't believe God and they didn't trust him? Like, let's you and I talk to them for just a second. What would you want to say to them? What did he do for you at the Red Sea? Did you see the quail that came down out of the sky and landed for your meat yesterday? Look at your shoes. Have they worn out since you've been traveling? Let me just say to us, are you, did you walk in the building today? Can you breathe without a breathing apparatus to help you today? Are you still alive today? Did God get you here today? Can we be thankful or does our lack of believing and trusting limit God? How many of you realize, you go, limit God, can God be limited? You can limit him in your life. Just as Jesus, when he walked in the Gospels, it talks about how Jesus went into Nazareth, and the Bible says that Jesus could do no mighty works there because of the lack of their faith. How many of you realize your faith grows as your thankfulness comes out? As you see the goodness of God, that's why I said, you know, your pain doesn't impact his goodness, but his goodness impacts your pain. If you need healing, we declare he is the healer. We declare to the solution, he is the, he is the solution to my need. My thankfulness, my praise, my worship is so important. 
There is a table, but only eyes of believing and trusting can see it. I want to use these weights because this is kind of what it feels like. <laughs> these are 10 pound. I was going to ask for 15. I'm glad they just brought 10 <laughs> a piece. But this is believing and this is trusting. And when you're walking through the desert and everybody else is like, it's too hard, it's too heavy. I don't want to do it. We're out here. I'm going to challenge you. Hang on to him. Hang on to believing. Hang on to trusting with everything you've got. And as you're walking through the desert, as you're walking, everybody else may not be lifting these weights, but are you? Father, I thank you that even though I don't see the provision right now, Father, I thank you that it's coming. Father, that you are faithful. Lord, if you parted the Red Sea, Father, you're going to get us across to the other side, to the promised land, that you've gone before me. You've made every crooked path straight. What's happening inside? What's happening to these muscles right now? How many of you know the desert season isn't to take you out? The desert season is a time to build you up, but you got to stay connected to your believing and to your trusting. And I'm not saying that I've never let them go because I've let them go many times. But how many of you know, just remember where you dropped them. God is always faithful to bring you right back because <laughs> you really don't get to move beyond. You just move backwards. And then you get to, oh, there, there they are. I thank you, and I believe today is somebody's day to pick up their believing and their trusting again and begin to say, it's not what I thought it looked like. How many know that's what Simon Peter had to do? As Jesus came to him, he had to pick up his believing and his trusting. And how many know we want to hug his neck really big and say, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Peter. Thank you that you believe. Because you believed and because you trusted, the world was transformed by the word that came through you. Twelve men changed the world because they didn't let go when a whole bunch of other people let go and walked away. Hang on to your believing. Hang on to your trusting. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Can he prepare a feast in the wasteland? Can God lavish upon us good gifts even when our surroundings are barren and our prayers still seem unanswered? Okay, this is so weak. Let me ask that again. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Can he prepare a feast for you in the wasteland? Can he lavish good gifts on you even when your surroundings are barren? And when your prayers still seem unanswered? When all we see is barren. That was much better, guys. Amen. You're convincing me now. When all we see is barrenness and loss... Can we believe and trust that God will bring something out of nothing? There is a table, and the devil will do anything he can to keep you from it. Because at the table, all he can do is watch you from a distance while God serves your life. Stay connected. Keep believing. Trust his salvation and never let go. And now we come to the answer. And the answer is called Table 23, Party of Two. And here we get to the main part of the text that I want to get to. There is a table in the wilderness, and it is a table for two. Psalms 23, 5, and 6 says this, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalms 23 is an invitation to a whole new way of life. Verse 5 says this, that you are invited to sit with Jesus at the table of his presence while your enemies watch you eat. If you're wondering who the guys are in back of me, that's my bodyguards. It's called goodness and mercy. And we'll talk about them and introduce them in just a little while, but I didn't want y'all to be distracted. 
but that's exactly what they are. So we're invited to sit at the table with Jesus. And guys, it's the table of his presence. It's a table that I sit at, the scripture says, while the enemies watch me eat. And not only does the devil watch, but your earthly enemies watch as the Lord pours out his oil of gladness on you. You see, this table is God's table And he's been patiently waiting for you to take your seat with him. Gordon, can I use you for a second? (laughs) He's used to me using him in in my power class. I didn't know if he was going to be here today or I would have let him know about this. But I just, I love, you just got to sit here and turn around and smile at everybody. (laughs) Show them. This is what, y'all, I believe God put, you got to look at them. I believe God put in his face what it looks like when God looks at you. Because he's got the most beautiful, inviting smile I think I've ever seen. And I believe, and I want, so I'm, he's representing the Lord today. Because this is the Lord's table. And God invites, and we would rehearse this earlier, but since I just asked him, but God literally pulls out the chair. This is his table. And I have a place there. And it's right next to him. This is Psalms 23. This is the place of abiding. So God's at the table. I'm at the table. His goodness and his mercy are right behind me at the table. He pulls out the chair, and then he anoints my head with oil. The scripture says that word anoint literally means to make fat. And we don't like that here in America, but that means to be healthy. He anoints us with the oil of his presence that brings health to our physical bodies. How many of you know the Bible is the only book that you can read and be healed as you read it? That's what it says. He sent his word to heal us and to deliver us from all of our diseases. He heals me in my soul, in my mind in my will and in my emotions. My confidence is restored at the table as we converse. And this is what it looks like. It may be, I know we've all seen the tables, the long tables, and there are the marriage supper, the lamb, and there are many seats there, and I've seen that table too. But everybody that sits at the table, they get to sit right next to Jesus. I just love your (laughs) smile. Because that smile invites me in. That smile is not to shame. That smile says, baby, you're mine. Sit right here. Do you know what I have for you? It's such a wonderful place. And on this, in this place, my confidence is restored at the table so that I'm no longer intimidated by the enemy. And he's out there. But I'm fascinated by Jesus. No longer intimidated. Too many times, guys, we live our Christian life like the Jews did in the midst of the the Israeli, in the midst of the desert. They were intimidated by the enemy when they should have been fascinated by the Lord. Have you got to that place where no longer does he fascinate you? I want to encourage you today, look again. Look again. On the table is a feast that God ordered specifically for you. The Bible says you prepare, which literally means, that word prepare means to put in order, to arrange in order. How many of you know if you go to a chef's house and you have a five-course meal, the meal is arranged in an order? Did you know that God has an arranged preparation with your name on it, not for everybody, just for you, in the right preparation, in the right order? And this feast is on the table. Luke 12, 37, Jesus describes himself as the waiter at the table. Literally, it says, blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will serve them. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe you've never even seen that before, that literally God himself, Jesus is the waiter at the table. He's the chef at the table. He's the one that's prepared the table. He pulls my seat out from the table. 
Because you know what, y'all? He is the feast. Amen. It's not just what he put there. He is the feast. He is the vine. We are the branches. He is the love. I receive that from him. So my question to you is, will you allow the Lord to serve your life, his will, his way? This is the place of real abiding. This is the vine and the branch life in, the John, in John 15 where Jesus says that we are to bring forth much fruit. It's the place of one-on-one -on -one with the word himself. It's the place where we learn to focus on the feast and not on the beast. It's here that I learn God doesn't just prepare this table for me in my times of victory, but especially in my times of failure. It's at the table that he anoints my head with oil and he heals me from the trauma of wilderness living. How many of you know the wilderness will bring trauma to your life? And God fills my cup to overflowing. I should have put a cup here, but imagine with me. Can you all imagine with me? Did you know that in that time period that a cup on a table, if you wanted your guests to stay, you, you would fill their cup? If you didn't want your guests, if they came and you were like, oh, I'm done and I'm ready for them to go, you would just let their drink run out. What does the scripture say? My cup does what? Overflows. It overflows. He fills my cup. It overflows. He wants me there with him. And not only does he want me there with him, but he wants me to be able to share from the fullness of what is in my heart, the love that is now exploding in my heart, not because I've performed well, but because he is good. Amen? Amen? Overflowing grace to get up and move forward with him is mine at the table of his presence. And oh yeah, let me introduce you here to goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy, I'll, I'll never forget when the Lord just gave me this quick picture of this, of what it looks like. But that word, goodness and mercy, will follow me. That word follow means to pursue, to chase, to catch, like a police officer that's trying to catch you when you've been speeding. Everybody, anybody ever looked in your back mirror and go, oh, no, I'm being followed and their lights are on. So what do you do? Hopefully you pull over. <laughs> this happened to me not that long ago. You pull over and your heart's racing. But let me tell you, why are you running? Let's pull over. Goodness and mercy are right and back. Amen. His goodness and mercy are pursuing us to overtake us. And when the enemy stands in front, so come on, guys, we're going. When the enemy stands in front of me, and the Bible says at this table, in the presence of my enemy, what does the enemy always try to do? He always tries to point you back to your past. He begins the trauma that we went through in the wilderness. He begins to point back to that. And when I look back, what do I see? Come on, big smiles. Get, get the God smile on over there. And what do I, when I try to go to my past, what do they do? You've got to look past God's goodness and his mercy to get back to your past. You've got to like crawl through their legs around them or something. God has seen to it that you are surrounded on every side. And that his goodness and mercy literally follow you to track you down, to literally, what is it? To overtake you with his goodness, his favor, his blessing. I love it. I, I think I got this visual because when we go to Angola prison, when we've had the honor to go in the past, Pastor Rusty, the first time he went, uh, sat down in the seat, and one of the guys, his name is Rambo, and he's a big guy. Some of you know Rambo. Sat right next to him kind of laid his hand on pastor's shoulder. Rusty didn't know who he was or what he wanted. <laughs> he said, pastor, I got your back. You don't have to worry. And literally to this day, if we were to go there, Rambo meets us at the front. He follows us everywhere we go. And he stands just like them. And we can be having a conversation with somebody over there. And he's watching. Because he knows who's who and he knows what's what. Yeah. And I love that. 
God's got my back and my past. What, what do goodness and mercy tell me? If I turn around and I look at them, the only thing they have to say, I should have had y'all rehearse this, is step into the new. The best is yet to come. They're pushing me forward. They're saying, let's go. There ain't nothing for you back there. It's time to move into your future. How many of you know that was Israel's problem in the desert? They, in this all of Psalm 78, they constantly said this. Oh, that we had died in Egypt. Oh, that we were back there. They forgot that they didn't have enough to eat, that they were slaves that they were being literally tortured. Oh, did you bring us out here, Moses, to kill us? And did you know because they didn't believe and they didn't trust, God allowed that generation, everybody that was 20 years old and or older, died. They got what they spoke. They literally got the words of their mouth, and they died in the wilderness. And the younger generation was the generation that went into the promised land. I want to encourage somebody today, until your dying breath, until you see Jesus face to face, let his praise Amen. ever be in your lips. When you look back, declare his goodness. I thank you that you parted the Red Sea. I thank you that I was a slave. I didn't, de I didn't deserve to be delivered. How many of you know none of us deserve to be delivered? None of us deserve the goodness of God. Thank you, Jesus, that you saw that we were but dust, and you came and you delivered. The fact that I can breathe today, I can walk in this building today, that I have two eyes that see and two ears that hear, is that enough to praise God for? This is the abiding place of life in Christ. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. They made a good God and a good goodness and mercy. This is the abiding place of Christ, and this is where we live connected. But the question is, will you take your seat at the table? Quit waiting for everyone else to take theirs. It's time for you. Worship team, if you'll come on up. Because, guys, this is, this is, if anything is in my heart that the Lord's just had on my heart, this has been years now that I, I see this. I, I see this picture. I, I pray this, that every person in this house will take their seat right next to him. He's called you. It's not for everybody else and not you. Even if you love to serve everybody else, it's for you. I have nothing to give anybody if I don't come right here. And I, you guys realize I'm using a physical table <laughs> to represent my relationship with Jesus and the table of his word. Every time I come to this word, I come to the table. And every time I come to the table, why do you go to the table in the physical realm? To be fed. You come to be fed so you can get up and you can live and you can work and you can enjoy life, right? That you have a purpose. So as I get up from this table, this table doesn't get up from me. This table lives inside of me. The table, this table lives inside of me. For Peter was out in the middle of a, of a sea when Jesus called him out and said, hey, if you want to come walk, come walk on the water for me. Peter found the table in the middle of the, the ocean. Wherever you are, God wants you to find the table of his presence. But you have to let go of your will your way. You have to let go of, of what it looks like, what you thought it was going to look like, and say, Lord, I want your will your way. I'm going to go ahead and ask everybody to stand, and I'm closing, but as you do, just keep your heart in an, an attitude of receiving. I want to sing. I want Lucy's going to lead us in a song, but just, I just encourage you to close your eyes and lift your hands before the Lord as we sing. And then I'm going to read something over you um, as you keep your eyes closed, but we'll lead you in that. But let's just worship the Lord for just a minute. You can lift your hands, you can keep your hands down, whatever you want, but I just want you to receive what God has for you this morning.
eyes closed, with your eyes, I just want you to see what I see. And this was a picture that the Lord showed me several years ago. I wrote it in my journal. I just want to read it to you, and I want you to see what I see because I believe it's a word for all of our lives. I see a table that you have invited me to sit at with you, Lord. It is the table of your presence. You sit at the head of the table, and I come, and I sit at your invitation to enjoy your presence, to lean into you, to hear your voice and instruction, your love and encouragement. I look into your eyes, and I see such incredible love and acceptance. I am whole in your presence. Your love is incredible, your eyes indescribable, and your heart for me is almost more than I can handle. From this place in your presence, I receive wisdom, strength, ability, and joy to get up and go forth to to, to fulfill your assignment over my life. No one but you, Lord, has the blueprint for the season ahead. I love being with you and I love being obedient to you as you instruct and teach me at the table of your presence. Thank you for your patience with me. Thank you for always inviting me back and making a place for me right next to you. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of the heavenly conversation and for creating within me a capacity to engage and respond with the divine. Wow. No greater honor could I ever know. So I just want to, with your eyes closed today, guys, there's a place for you at the table. And maybe you've never sat at the table of the Lord, at the table of his presence before. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you've come in today and say, Ann, I want to take my place. It's, it's time to take my place. I want to know him as my Lord and Savior. See, only those that are related to him can sit here. And what makes me related to him is when I get born again. When I exchange my dead life for his life. When I exchange my old man for the new man in Christ Jesus. And maybe that's you today and you say, I've I've never been born again. I want to be born again today. If that's you today, just raise your hand. And we're going to pray together as a congregation If that's you and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe you say, well, I did as a little kid. Maybe it's your time to come back, to renew that commitment to the Lord. This, I'm going to tell you, the only thing, and you can open your eyes for a second, the only thing that I can give to the Lord at the table is believing and trusting. So even as we come to the table of salvation today, I have to give him I believe that you died for my sins. I trust that you came to give me new life and I receive. My posture at the table is always one of receiving. So with your eyes closed today, if that's you, come on, let's pray. There are people in the house. Maybe they don't know the Lord. This is the greatest thing we can ever do. We don't want to rush through this. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today's your day to know. Today's your day to take your place at the table. Just raise your hand. And like I said, we're going to pray together. And secondly, if you, if this word is just stirred in you and you, you've been in that place like we all have, going across that desert and there hadn't been any praise or thankfulness in your mouth and you say, I want to sit at the table with the Lord. I want the oil of his anointing to heal my life. If that's stirred inside of you today, Just raise your hands and I'll know. We're going to pray a prayer together. We're going to receive together. I believe we're going into a whole new season. And the reason why you need to be refreshed, the reason why you need to be healed is because there's a promised land to move into. And the promised land has giants in it. And it doesn't need weak people moving in. It needs people who've been building up their faith in the Lord, who know their God and who are going to do mighty exploits. God has called you for more than what you've been doing. God has called you for more than what you know yourself to be. He hasn't even begun to show you who you really are yet. How many of you want to see? It's time to take your place. So let's lift our hands before the Lord, and I'm going to pray. And I just believe God's going to release over you an anointing to move into into the new. An anointing to sit, to love, to enjoy 
to be enraptured in him. So, Father, I pray today and I thank you, Lord God, that you have come to anoint our heads with oil. Father, you see every heart and you know, Father God, where they are right now. And I thank you that they see themselves pulling. Lord, as you pull the chair out, they're going to take their place. They're going to take their place. And I thank you, Father, that we're going to be able to look into your eyes and they're going to see what they've never seen before. I thank you, Lord, that they're going to see love and grace and acceptance drawing them in. They're going to hear the word of the Lord over their lives. Oh, Father God, that's going to challenge and strengthen them and equip them, Father. And from there, they'll get up and live and move and have their being, Lord, as they live life at the table of your presence, Father. Thank you for fresh oil. Thank you for healing, Father, to the deepest, most wounded place of the human soul. Thank you, Lord, that the trauma of the desert season is going to be erased today, Father, as your anointing comes to deliver. And the joy, Father, you said the joy that our fruit would be abundant and our joy would be full, Father. I release that over each and every person today. We receive it. We thank you for it. We give you praise and honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Everybody said amen. Amen. Wasn't that such a great word this morning? Listen, before you move, before you move, I just want to extend an invitation to those who, um, to those who accepted the Lord into their heart. Maybe you prayed. Maybe, as she said, you didn't have a seat at the table. Well, this morning, I'm here to tell you, you have a seat, and we want to share with you about that seat that you now have at the table. So if you accepted Jesus into your heart for the first time, or if you rededicated your life today, we want to see you right, as soon as I dismiss, we want to see you right over here at our Making New Banner. Um, we've got some information that we want to put in your hands um, and just let you know that, that there is more. Everybody say more. That there is more for you. Wasn't that a great word, church? Wasn't that an amazing word? Man, she told me earlier in the week about the whole goodness and mercy following you thing. I about fell out of, fell out of my chair and like just started crying because it was just so good. Um, listen, church, we love you. Just one.